Uh, every once in a while, I get caught up in uh, technological issues. I'm younger than you are, but I'm still, you know, a dumb metalhead that can't really figure things out too much. <laughs> what are you, I'm sitting right here. Are you talking about me like that? <laughs> What's up, everyone, and welcome to the RRBG podcast. Today, I am being joined by New Jersey legend Bobby Blitz of Overkill. How are you, brother? That's a lot of responsibility being called a legend. I'll tell you that. But it's <laughs> good to see you. Everything, everything's well. You know, I had a guy say that to me once on a podcast from Europe. I said, let me tell you something. You see me cutting my own lawn on a Sunday, that whole legend thing goes to hell. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, end of the day, we're all still human, right? We still got responsibilities and shit. So, uh, so, so are you are you in New Jersey right now? Yeah, I'm in my home. Uh, you know, taking care of press. You know, I mean, we work on a clock of you know, write, record, promote, tour. Uh, so now we're in the promotion phase. I handle the majority of it, unless I ask for the other guys. Uh, excited about it because I mean, just to be back to work um, under normal circumstances is a you know is a great feeling to to see Peter Bantemic in the uh, in the rearview mirror. You know, for sure, for sure. I mean, it, it's weird. It's such a weird vibe because I'm 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 on board with you. Like I'm back to going to shows all the time and being out and doing things and back to normal as they say. But uh, but you know, it's still like there's still people sick. I don't know. It's just weird. It feels like we just gave up. Like, you know what? We're done. We're going back out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I had that feeling in the middle of it. I was like, I'm done with this. I'm fucking, I'm done. <laughs> Let's push back. Let's push back. <laughs> yeah. I'm from New Jersey as well. I wanted, you know, wanted to bring that up. I was born in Christ hospital in Jersey city. Uh, oh, no shit. I'm, uh, I'm Margaret Hay. Nice. Nice. Jersey yeah. City. <laughs> I moved when I was 15 to Miami and then uh, from there came over here to L.A., which is where I'm at now. But, you know, my heart's still over there in that uh, grimy, cloudy city. You might you might be the smartest Jersey boy that, that ever lived. I mean, you never get tired of shoveling sunshine, do you? Oh, dude. <laughs> that was definitely one of the, the one of the things. I mean, back in I think it was 92 is when my family decided they were like we ended up leaving in 95. But. When that blizzard happened in 91 or 92 where we got like six feet of snow, that's when they were like, mm -mm, we're not doing this. <laughs> oh, man, it was right up to my windows. And I have an exposed foundation. Unbelievable. Yeah, I jumped off of my second floor balcony into the snow and it, nothing happened. Just just flew and landed right into the snow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, you guys, it's very exciting that you got a new album, April 14th, coming out Nuclear Blast Records, Scorched. Uh, is this number 19 or is this 20? Just 20. Jesus. 20 albums. He, he who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> you know, Buckethead is uh, considered a metal band. They have actually 300 releases. What? Some Somebody the other day came on. He goes, you may think that with your 20th that you're leading the way. He goes, but Buckethead has over 300 releases. I was blown away. Buckethead, I mean, I had the, to get online and start looking at it, you know? The guitarist, right? The guy that was in Guns N' Roses for a bit? No, no, it's, uh, oh, it might not be Buckethead. Uh, I'll look it up for you. I'll make sure I send it to you. Okay. It's 300 not, it's releases, not, though. I mean, it's one of those things like Stephen King, like, they can't all be good. <laughs> you know what I That's mean? That's what they say in 20. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how long, what was the gap between uh, this one and the last one in 19? Well, it's uh, Wings of War was uh, February of nineteen. Mm. This will be April of twenty three. So just over just over four years, which okay. is the longest period of time we've ever been between two records. Um, and it's obviously pandemic related. It had nothing to do with lack of material or lack of drive. We just wanted to make sure that if we released it, that we could simultaneously tour. Yeah, uh, this is where we feel it gets its legs. I mean, we're, we're obviously not the upper echelon. We know where we are. We know how to promote ourselves. And one of the ways to promote yourself is release, you know, release yourself a stellar record, something really solid, something that says it's you, says you're back, but get out there on the road and make sure people hear those new songs live. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if a lot of bands put out records during the pandemic and uh, they just kind of, 
You, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Continue. I'm sorry. No worries. I can edit this out. It's cool. I've been doing interviews for like the last six hours. It's like your battery's low. You have like three minutes. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, I can I can make an edit point here. So go ahead, repeat your question. Uh where was it? Oh. No, I don't remember now. <laughs> um no, I think it, it was a uh... related for sure. It was pandemic related. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I was saying, oh, okay, and I remember. I was saying that, uh, you know, certain bands dropped records during the pandemic, and then because there was no tour, it was kind of like a, you know, just listen to it, cool, and it just disappears, you know, and like no one really gets to appreciate it that much. They move on to the next record that's being dropped or whatever it is, you know? Well, there's simultaneous, you know, promotion with the tour and the record, so it, it gives it legs, you know, it gives it life. And I think that, you know, it interests it, it, it sparks interest in people if they like the record to come out and see the band live. Um, we've always worked on that clock of, you know, write, record, promote, release, and tour. And we've just done that, you know, for since, since 1985, every two years. But I do think that under these circumstances, <clears throat> with the, you know, the recent tragedy of the pandemic, that it gave us the opportunity to, you know, to kind of look at ourselves and look at the record and, 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 push the, you know, push the boundaries a little bit, you know, aspire to make it even a better record than we would under a normal progression. And I think, you know, in my, in my opinion, we succeeded, or at least my internal success uh, feels satisfied. That's good. I mean, that's all that matters at the end of the day, honestly, if you're proud of your work, uh, you know, because you can't please everyone. If you put something out and some people don't like it, some people do, it's, it, it, as long as you're happy with it, that's all that really matters i think at the end of the day um is this going to be your first tour now you're going on tour with x hoarder and heathen is this the first tour since uh, the pandemic as the, the have you played live since well we you know we were on the road when that that shit happened and um we made it up to jersey from the carolinas a couple of days later you know the whole world was shut down that was 2020 i think it was 609 days later we made up a show that we had booked in new jersey so in 2021 <laughs> okay. November 14th, 2021, we actually did a show in a place called the Wellmont Theater in Montclair, New Jersey as makeup. And then about a year ago, it was um, it was just March, we went out and finished up uh, the tour that we were doing for the Wings of War. We added another 18 shows about a year ago. So we have been out on the road. Okay. Uh, we did do festivals over the summer in Europe, but we did a full tour last March. Do you feel like it's back, like really back? Like, are people as energetic or more energetic than they were uh, before? Like, because I feel like a lot of the shows I've been to, it's been hit or miss. Like, either the crowd is nuts because they just wanted to get out, or people are kind of still hesitant and kind of sitting back and not moshing too much or crowd surfing too much. Well, I think as, you know, as time passes, it becomes more and more normal. Um, the tour in March was really good for us. I mean, it was full houses, and I think. You no, know, I think you're right with regard to people really wanted to fucking get out. I mean, I think they were just, they were tired of being hemmed in and, you know, and they were pushing back on this, you know, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of that never again kind of a vibe going on, you know, I'm not sitting in my house again for, for, for three years ever again. And, yeah. and, you know, you can't blame people. I mean, I feel exactly the same way. I mean, I was writing the lyrics to this record, you know, and I was, it was my, my personal life had changed um, at that time. I, you know, I'm coming home, the world shut down. I was just on a stage in Raleigh in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Now I'm back home and I'm writing lyrics for this record. And I'm so, I'm just so down after a couple of months. I'm like living here by myself, drinking beer and riding a motorcycle. That's it. So I'm doing it, writing lyrics. So it was kind of depressive. And I think that, you know, I, I, I thought about it when I was reading them and I said, you know, this isn't me. This isn't us. And I tore it down. I tore it down again. It's like got kind of that pushback vibe, you know, that kind of like positive aggression type of a type of a thing. And it, it really became kind of therapeutic for me to to be able to be working on a record in such a kind of a weird, dark time, uh, because I just I didn't want to be eaten alive by it. And it uh, but it gave me an outlet or it gave me sanity amongst the insanity or 
uh, normalcy among the abnormality. Right. Uh, so I think that the record benefited because of that. I mean, not like I want another pandemic, but right. the fact that we had uh, that we had four years between records, um, the, the winner was the record itself. For sure, man. And, you know, that is something that, that I've thought about a lot. It's, you know, the pandemic sucked. It got us in a very weird spot, but it did force a lot of us to change how we think of things. Like even this show, for example, like I didn't have video for this podcast before. I would just show up to shows with my little recorder and a mic and we just talk and it was all audio. But then when this whole thing stopped, I'm like, well, I can't meet meet the bands. They're not on tour. Like, how am I going to do this? And and it kind of evolved into a video thing. And uh, it, it helped the show. And like you're saying, the the record is people have more time to take a breather and like maybe, you know, flesh out some ideas more. So even though it was a terrible time and we don't want it again, it was still very, I think, good for us to just take some time to step back and like re reanalyze because we get caught in the grind you know you get in that grind and keep pushing and doing the same thing and that's how you end up with like a monotonous kind of vibe with your life where people get bored and they quit or bands break up you know that kind of thing you know i i think you're right and i i think reevaluation and reinvention are were really important to come out the other side of this you know with a spring in your step you know, yeah. not like not like the beaten dog kind of a thing. You know, I mean, you had to reevaluate. You had to figure shit out. You know, you had to find other ways. I mean, the fact that you've upgraded your, your own podcast is, is testimony to that. And I think that a lot of people did. I mean, I remember sitting here and I was, you know, I'd be like reading the news on my phone or on the computer and working on the record. I was doing some stuff for some other people at the same time. And somebody gives me a call and they go, yeah, they're thinking of closing all the liquor stores in Jersey. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> mm -mm. That's a bad what? move. And I'm like, I'm calling this dude. I'm like, look, man, I want three cases of yingling. And I'm, <laughs> I'll meet you at the back door. <laughs> but I'm saying, what fucking crazy behavior is what, is what I'm saying, you know? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't. And I said, I got to fucking stop this shit. You know, I mean, this is not the way I live my life, you know, mm. that I'm, I'm worried about what, what, you know, what the next tragedy is going to be. Not that they're uh, closing the liquor stores would be a tragedy, but I'm saying to it's put pretty, things in perspective. It is pretty devastating. A perspective to have, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I think, again, that uh, the fact that, you know, in, in my case, I kind of buckled down and said, I'm not, I'm not eating this shit. I'm not eating this. I've eaten enough of this. I mean, this don't taste good. I'm going to rewrite this record and it's going to be an overkill. So hell yeah, man. And so I, I wanted to ask you when you're, when you're writing the record, I mean, 20 records in all, you know, since the, since 85, like how, how do you motivate yourself to keep it fresh, to keep it uh, exciting? Because, you know, I, I, I would be bored after five records, you know what I mean? Like writing five, like, I'd be like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing the same thing. Like, how do you, how do you keep it fresh? What do you do to give yourself like new, influences and, and things like that to, to write? Well, I, you know, I, I mean, there's a couple of factors here. You know, first, I don't overthink it. Um, I mean, it, it's about opportunity for me. You know, I did this because I love doing it. I mean, it's really, it's really simple. There's no fucking other plan of coming in the back door and being a pop band. You know what I'm saying? I like Levi's motorcycle boots. I like Harley Davidson's. I like loud, fast fucking music. And I like good times with my friends, you know, having a drink here and there and, and some, and some good, rough, violent fucking sport. I mean, that's what I like. <laughs> <I'm a very laughs> <man>. <laughs> so I don't overthink shit. But, the, uh, but I'm also lucky to have a partner who is constantly pushing the parameters of his talent. I mean, the guy is involved, Didi Verney is involved in, in different projects. He's, he's done the Bronx Casket Company, very gothic kind of a, an approach to things. He's done a Cadillac band, uh, you know, kind of a rockabilly approach to to things. I mean, he thinks in, in you know, he thinks it, it, it's like parallels and tangents and layers. And when you listen to this record musically, that's how I stay inspired because I never know what to expect from him. I mean, sure, there's The Surgeon. I mean, that's Overkill 101. That's a thrash song. But then you look at Fever. That has nothing to do with this band. Nothing. You know, I mean, we've done mellow tunes. We've done heavy tunes. But we've never joined them together like that with that kind of a riff and those kinds of melodies. Um, traditional heavy metal songs like Won't Be Coming Back or Going Home. Uh, traditional thrash songs, but with a bluesy groove, scorched, 
a blues ride like Wicked Place. This is really inspiring to not get 10 of the same kind of tunes that I can, from record to record, kind of depend on the fact that he's going to push. If he pushes the envelope or raises the bar for himself, it only gives me the opportunity to do the same and uh, aspire to be a better lyric and melody writer and aspire to be a better singer. Does it worry you at all that perhaps like m moving the needle too much into any other direction, like, you know, going a little slower and melodic or, or you know, heavy or dark, like might uh, w throw off some of your the, the thrash heads like that are, oh, they're going soft. <laughs> any of that? You know what? One of the best things about growing old is not giving when a you shit. say you don't give a shit, you mean it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes. You've had a dad or a grandfather, right? And your grandfather says, Eddie, I don't give a shit. You know he means it. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. I, I, I never understood that. I never understood the the like the elitist metal heads that are like, oh, there's there's melody that's that shouldn't be here. Like, it's fine. <laughs> Relax. You know, they're all. You know, people are people, and, you know, I, I think that they have their right to do whatever they'd like to do, whoever they are. I've always felt honored to be part of this community, um, and I think of it as a community. I think of it more as a religious experience than, than to necessarily just be music that we listen to, because some of us are so tied to it, and it's ingrained in us. And there's so many people that are the real deal, whether they're in bands or whether they're, you know, guys on podcasts or or just people who are fanatics about it, that it's a, it's a commonality that bonds us. And sure, I mean, people have opinions. It's fine. I mean, I, but I really, you know, for me, I really don't care. And that's kind, of the, that's kind of the good part about writing songs at this particular point in my life. You know, I mean, somebody asked me, well, what would you say? What, how would you describe the record? I would say, well, it sounds like an experienced bunch of guys wrote it. And then it said mature. And I said, shit, that was a dirty word in my 50s. But in my 60s, it's kind of a compliment, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I said, yeah. yes, mature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've never understood that that anger towards bands like maturing or whatever it is. I, I think it shows the the termination that you guys have. I mean, the fact that you're like the style, your style of vocals is very unique. Uh, in, in, in that scene, like that, not many bands are doing that anymore. I mean, back in the day, there were a couple, you know, you listen to like an ACDC maybe or, you know, stuff like that with the, with a higher range of screaming. Uh, they don't do that much anymore. Like the newer bands aren't doing that. Uh, so it, the fact that you stuck with your style and kind of evolved it and, and you know, it's it's a commendable thing, you know. Well, thank you. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's a unique situation for me because... I mean, I know I can send people running for the fucking hills with some of those screens, you know, I mean, I get it. It's not like it's not for everybody. You know, I endear myself to a minority, um, but my voice has actually gotten better as time went on. I mean, I dropped cigarettes about 10 years ago and it, that high end that I only could have up here in my nose has dropped to my mouth. And I actually have a chest and a, and a, and a stomach voice now, you know, a diaphragm voice, something I can put lower. And it's it's been a an epiphany for me to be able to say, fuck, I mean, it's actually, I can do more things at this particular time. And it would be a shame to not use that. If I take that all the way back to when I was a kid, you know, singing in the shower to uh, fog hat or black Sabbath or, you know, whatever was, was the flavor of the day for me at that time, I'm kind of reliving all of that stuff, you know, with a record like scorched. I mean, you, you listen to a song like wicked place, man, it's a fucking blues ride. You know, that thing is just swinging back and forth. That is like, that is, you know, that is the old Black Sabbath kind of vibe on steroids, you know, with a fresh 2023 face. But I felt those grooves when I was, you know, when I was 15 years old. And now I actually get the opportunity this many years later, even in my own career, to be able to approach those songs just a little differently than I would have approached them in like 1989 or 1995. Yeah, man, that's awesome. That's awesome. Are there any bands that you're listening to now that are younger that that you think are maybe carrying the torch? Like, I, I know a lot of people, you know, would have said the thrash flag was being flown by like Power Trip, you know, but unfortunate their, their singer passed away yeah, and everything. Right. Uh, but is there yeah. any b bands right now that you you know think are carrying the torch for the future? 
that's a unique question because you know when I'm when I'm doing a record, I'm usually not listening to stuff like that as to not, you know, as not to be pushed in any directions. I know a lot of people like to stay current with, and I do when I you know for my own enjoyment. And and the record's been done for a while, and I should get back into it. But when I come out of a record, I kind of detox. It's kind of a, you know, it's kind of like I send myself to rehab for for a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, for my ears, you know, and I've been listening to some of the most fucked up shit. Uh, I mean, I can't believe it. I've been listening to the Highwaymen, which is Willie Nelson and and Johnny Cash and uh, Will Jennings and Christopherson. Um, and I think Chris Christopherson is one of the best songwriters America ever had. You know, in my opinion. But that's a whole other story. I mean, there's Amy Winehouse is on my playlist. Um, I the. Metal I just got into just again, and it's a it's a revival for me. Um, uh, was and I just found it accidentally the other day. I found Manowar um live in Bremen, Germany. And you know, there was a time I remember back before we were even releasing records where I thought that that was the benchmark of a, a record called Battle Hymns was the benchmark for what a heavy metal band should be. And I just saw a live performance of them doing the song Battle Hymn in Bremen, Germany, and it blew my fucking mind. I mean, the lights, the, the, oh my God, how tight it was, how syncopated it was. It was just, it was just perfect. But coming up, being on tour, I'm going to have plenty of time sitting with the boys and uh, trade notes on some of the new bands for sure. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. I I was going to ask you that too, when you're writing, if you, because a lot of people do take that that route of not listening to anything so as to not get influenced and maybe, you know, change the direction or get pushed away into a, a certain like, Oh, you know what? I'm going to try doing that, you know, and maybe at the end of the day, you end up copying somebody. You know what I mean? I, I I'm kind of like that. I did. You know what I did do? I, I recently was over at a buddy's house, Mike Portnoy, right? And we, I stopped at Mike's house and we were shooting the shit and I was asking about his son, Max, and he goes, oh, he's living, uh, he's living in Pittsburgh now with uh, with Code Orange. I was like, and then that got me into that. Again. So, so it's not like I'm totally, totally gone, but I was listening to the last Code Orange because of Max. They were one. They they changed their sound drastically uh, from when they, because I remember hearing them when they were Code Orange kids and it was a little more hectic and like, I want to say like Dillinger Escape Plan kind of kind of crazy and then now they've they've evolved into more of a i won't say radio friendly but like there's like industrial elements it's a little they're they're on tv now with like the wwe and stuff like that so it, it uh it's wild to see that transition for them you know it worked to make the band bigger uh and yeah for sure you know it, it's to me it's always more commendable not more commendable but it's commendable to me that you guys haven't done something like that to to kind of blow up you know what i mean because when you do stuff like this and it becomes your career you know it, the thought comes into your head of like well you know i want to i want to get i want it to get bigger i want more people to hear it but that's going to require change because not not everybody's going to be into thrash or heavy metal you know well i suppose you know i mean it's as long as we're having a conversation i mean i'm not allergic to dead presidents you know mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying i mean I, everybody needs to 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 make their to make their bones and 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 make their bills, but yeah. for sure there's certain things I won't do. <laughs> you can't expect a dubstep record from you anytime soon, or uh... <laughs> uh, I'd like to hear your solo rap debut. Actually, <laughs> never wore pink underwear. Never. Su- <laughs> never. 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 <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you a question since you're, you know, you're, you've been in the metal slash thrash scene for so long. And um, I always find myself bringing in the similarities between, I, I convince, try to convince my punk friends and I'm not calling them punks. I'm saying that, that are into punk music, uh, into thrash, because I find so many similarities in the style, like the drumming style specifically, you've got that, that, you know, kick snare, kick snare real fast. Uh, what what are some of the similarities you've seen between th- thrash and punk? And you know, how how would you identify thrash to someone that's a punk rocker? Well, if you go back to the origins of what thrash was, I mean, a thrash was just created really out of thin air um, because it was different influences that came in. You know, there was a new wave of British heavy metal. There was traditional heavy metal. You know, there was Angel Witch, and then there was Judas Priest. You know, mm. so traditional and new wave. 
uh, Tigers of Pantang, you know, new wave of British heavy metal. Uh, and there was punk. There was West Coast punk. There was East Coast punk. There was European punk. It all kind of mixed together. You take that metal and you take that punk. That's where you get thrash out of. It's the energy of punk and it's that beat. And, and the drum beat that the, that the punks are doing really just, you know, it's a, in many cases, it's a rock and roll beat on, on steroids or on speed, you know, that makes it happen, that gives it that, you know, taken off like a, like a plane. I went to the university in, uh, in uh, a college in, in uh, New York, in New York City, and it was right on the one line. And the one line dr drops you, the train, the subway drops you right off of Greenwich Village. This was when the punk scene was happening in the city. I mean, we're talking about the Ramones, you know, are not playing like, you know, big, not that they ever play big places, not huge places. Anyway, no, no, like, you know, arenas. But there was the Ramones, there was the Dead Boys, there was the New York Dolls, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, television, the original Blondie. It was like fucking, it was like, it was like a circus of just freakdom, you know, and this great fucking music. And I'm coming out of college and I'm taking this with me and I'm singing in a heavy metal band, you know, doing covers. It's only natural once I met somebody like Dee Dee and the drummer Rat Skates that we was if we were going to write original songs, it was going to be all the shit we love. And the difference to me between the West Coast and the East Coast is we had different punk. They had the Dead Kennedys. We had the Dead Boys. You know, that was the the Dead Boys. They wrote kind of the rock and roll songs. They were kind of like bubblegum. Ramon songs were bubblegum songs. You know, yeah. Phil Spector type songs. Yeah. Fucking, you know, Dead Kennedys were way fucking out there. So I think that it was a, you know, it was a, a meeting of the two minds that made what punk is. And I think you could see the difference, like in an Anthrax, for instance, as opposed to like a Metallica, you yeah. know, Metallica wrote their shit out there, uh, <clears throat> listening to whatever was going on out there. They had to come to New Jersey to release their record. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote it all out there. And guys like Anthrax or Overkill wrote all their shit in the New York, New Jersey area. So it was just there was just different elements, even though those elements were cousins of each other. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. As a kid growing up, too, in New Jersey, I, I, I got into punk and but it was all like West Coast punk. It was like no effects or, you know, Pantywise yeah. or, you know, those kinds of bands. I never never really got too much into the East Coast side of it. East Coast to me represents more like hardcore. That shit preceded you, too, by by like, you know, almost a generation. You, you have to think of it that way. I mean, I was I was 18 when I was hearing this stuff, you yeah. know, I mean, so. I mean, think of the difference. You, you're you're really in the second wave when you get to, to to Pennywise and NoFX, as opposed to the shit that was, you know, happening in New York City. You know, Iggy Pop moved to New York City, you know, to go hang out with Andy Warhol. You know, it was like the biggest news back then. But we had no fucking social media. There was no there was no technology where the guys on the East Coast are communicating with the guys on the West Coast in instant in the moment. You can't do it in the moment. You'd have to do it by snail mail or the phone. You know, how do you trade tapes? How do you do this and how do you do that? But now it's a it's a whole, you know, one big world is actually smaller based on how we communicate and how we trade things. But I do think that that separation, you know, made for thrash on the East Coast and made for thrash on the West Coast two different entities yet cousins of each other. For sure, for sure. Uh, in the East Coast, though, I mean, to, when I went to visit recently, uh, it had been years since I had been to New Jersey or New York, and you know, I was in, like reintroduced into like the hardcore scene out there. Like, uh, I forget the name of the the restaurant or the the bar out there in uh, in New York that I went to. That it's like the birthplace. See, there's a picture on the wall of like the Beastie Boys and all these dudes in the in the hardcore scene. I forget what it's called now, uh, but. Were you ever into that scene as well, like the hardcore scene, or did you ever just did you just stick to metal and, and thrash? Well, you know, as, as this whole thing evolved, I mean, the hardcore scene to a very large degree came out of the punk rock scene too. Yeah, and uh, you know, back in the eighties, nineties, we would do shows with Gnostic Front. Right. You know, uh, you know, Overkill with the Chromags is was not an unusual bill back then. So we were for sure exposed to it. Did a lot of shows with Leeway, Madball, Sick of It All. I mean, these were the, the, the hardcore bands of that era. There was a huge dividing line between the two bands. But for some reason, the promoters would always put it together and they'd bring in hardcore kids and metal kids to fill the, to fill the clubs up. 
And at first it was a fucking bloodbath. I mean, it was, it was just, you know, there was lines of, you know, guys in the leather jackets over here and guys in lines with over here with, you know, suspenders and, and, and Doc Martens running at each other, you know, to see who, who's standing after that. But eventually the, I think the hardcore bands took on much more of a musicality, you know, with bands like LOA um, who were, were born of the hardcore scene, but, you know, became so melodic. And, you know, The River Runs Red was one of the best records of, of that year and maybe of all time when it came uh, to that scene. And that's because of how they incorporated metal into it and how the metal bands incorporated some of that hardcore attitude into it, especially out of New York. So I think that for sure, that's another um, real positive meeting of the minds and, and meeting of musicality to uh, to ex expand or extend, extend both genres. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You mentioned that Ramones never played an arena or stadium like that size thing, but you don't think about that these days. You, you know, there's such a big brand. I hate to call them that, but they're a brand. You see their shirts at fucking Target. You know what I mean? So uh, it's such a big brand that you think in your brain that like, oh, yeah, these are massive artists that were playing stadiums and whatnot. But it's it's funny to hear that. Right. We used to dress in exactly the same uniform. Black leather jacket, biker jacket, white T-shirt, ripped jeans, um, Chuck Taylors. We go down to St. Mark's Place, which is which is 8th Street, over on the east side of, of the village. And we, we do this thing called Ramon spotting. Because you could hang out there on a Saturday, you'd wait <laughs> long enough, one of them would walk by. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, you'd have a beer in your bag looking like one of the Ramones, you know, like this, drinking a beer. And they'd have a beer in their bag walking past you. <laughs> or across the street or something but you'd see them it wasn't uncommon to see them they were part of the local local fabric yeah so it's funny because those types of bands that have gotten to this point where they're at target or whatever it is uh your brain kind of has like a different memory of it but it makes sense to me that the ramones would not play a stadium i don't think thrash or punk or like even metal to to a certain extent like doesn't belong in that size of a, of a venue like i like the smaller clubs that you know we can mosh we can jump on top of each other and the crowd surfing in the stadium it feels kind of soulless well i think you know you got to also think too i gotta i gotta make it quick here because i gotta move on yeah I, yeah i missed this whole interview today but I'll, I'll i'll finish here i mean you think too that you know what how it grows in your head it's, it's like you know it's the first girlfriend kind of a thing too i mean you, you know where you, your first relationship gets bigger and bigger and bigger in your head the first good one you know and it, it's just like oh boy those were the days and everything you know but the thing i think that people forget about the ramones um specifically is it, nobody ever forgets their talent and what they could do with three chords and how they can turn that into magic you know, over a two minute and 30 second period of time. They forget somewhere in there, they compare it to the rest and they forget their purity that they pushed back with what they were presenting, whether it be lyrically or whether it be with their lifestyle or whether it be with whatever. And maybe that held them back, but that's why the fucking, the memory is huge this day. The purity was there, I think from the start all the way to the finish. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, Joey Ramone introduced us at the Ritz. It was like our biggest gig to date. We were headlining the Ritz in New York City. I mean, it's probably like a 1200 seater. It was fucking awesome. And the guy walks into the fucking dressing room and I almost fucking shit right in my pants. It's fucking <laughs> Joey Ramone messing around over in the cooler, you know, looking for something to drink. You know? <laughs> yeah. He didn't even ask to come in. He just came in. So I went over and we asked him to, to introduce us. And it, in classic fucking Joey Ramone, came right out and told the truth when he introduced us. Hi. Uh, these guys asked me to introduce them. They gave me a couple of drinks upstairs. I don't really know anything about them, but I know they're from New York and New Jersey, so that's cool by me. Myself, fucking great. If he like, was all hopping up and down, it would have been fucking stupid. Yeah. But he fucking, he did it just like he, 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 he did it natural, like himself, and I was, I was, I thought it was the best introduction we've ever had in our, our entire career. 
That's amazing, man. Well, I'm going to let you go since, you know, you do have another interview. But everybody that's watching and listening, please pick up Scorched April 14th on Nuclear Blast Records. Uh, the tour starts in April as well with X Hoarder. Uh, you'll see us in the States uh, probably June, July. Uh, okay. In Europe, if you're watching, we start in Germany on the 13th of April. Uh, we're going to go for about a month or so over there. Uh, keep your eyes peeled. Enjoy the record. Eddie, it's always a pleasure. Take we'll care, see you brother. out there on the, uh, on the West Coast, my friend. Absolutely. Take care. See ya. All right, bro. Take care, bro. <laughs>